ladies and gentlemen, Sana Lathan, Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> Richard Dreyfus. Yeah. Gina Bythewood. <laughs> and Reggie Bythewood. So Gina and Sanai must tell you, I have a guilty pleasure, love in basketball. Uh. I, if it's on, it's that and The Godfather. <laughs> if it's on, I'm, I know they're not exactly the same productions, but those are the films that I always gravitate to. Wow, thank you. Um, Reggie, what's to start with you and Gina? Um, this is not just a husband and wife, showrunner, producer, writer, creator team. In fact, this is a real personal uh, family story. In fact, your son had even a part in, of some sort in the making of this production. Can you tell us? Sure. Um, so, so back in July of 2013, uh, George Zimmerman was on trial, uh, second degree manslaughter, I believe, for uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And I watched the verdict come in with my oldest boy, who was 12 at the time. Excuse me, our oldest boy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, and uh, so we, we watched the verdict come in, and when Zimmerman was found not guilty, um, I was rocked, but uh, our son was, was, was really rocked, and um, you know, his, his eyes you know, welled up with tears, and instead of you know, consoling him, um, I pulled open the laptop, pulled up an Emmett Till documentary on YouTube, and had him watch it. And after he watched it, we began to talk about um, how the criminal justice system has worked in this country and in, in some ways how it, it has not worked. Um, and uh, so, so Cassius, had, you know, Cassius is our son, and you know, it really led to a bunch of conversations. Um, Cassius actually ended up writing this short story of Trayvon Martin going to heaven to meet Emmett Till, which actually found, his short story found its way in hour five of Shots Fired. But we had really begun to think about doing something in this space. And, um, you know, a few years later, uh, Fox had, had, had come to us and, and asked if we were interested in doing anything in this arena. And because we had really been talking about it and actually started working on a screenplay, we jumped at this opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was great because when we talked about it, we looked at it and we said, well, wow, we can do like this 90 minute, two hour film, or we could actually do a 10 hour film. And, and that's, you know, that's what we did. And you took real advantage of that, by yeah. giving Absolutely. us something so textured and nuanced. I've seen most of it. It's just incredibly, not just topical, topical but just riveting uh, television. And incredibly musical. Maybe we'll talk about that as well. Yeah. There's, music is its own story here. So, Sana, this could not have just simply been a nostalgia trip for you and Gina to go back in time. There was something that drew you to this character. Well, she had been begging me for the last <laughs> 17 years. No, um, <laughs> It's funny because Love and Basketball, when we were shooting it, for me, I was just trying to get through the production because I, was, I didn't know how to play basketball. And she surrounded me with real basketball players. Do you know that I did not know this? <laughs> yeah. Because in the film, I was just going to say, what a silky smooth jump shot. But, but now yeah. I know it's not yours. Yeah. No, it there is. Was, a, she uh, it was me. She trained oh. <laughs> I trained, but it was like, it was torture. But anyway, that's, that's then. But, um, <laughs> It, I didn't know it was going to kind of become this new classic. Um, because of social media, I get tweeted every time it's on TV, and they play it on TV all the time. And people love it. People of all ages, you know, uh, everything. They come up to me all the time. And so anyway, we created this thing together, and we've been friends. And I've wanted to work with her since. And you know, she's been begging me. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> But finally, this project, we did actually, we did Disappearing Acts right, right after Love with Basketball. With Wesley tonight. Yes. But finally this came up and it just, it was just the best package for me. It was Gina and Reggie who also, I love his work and we had kind of worked together on, on things over the years that never really came to fruition, but we had a relationship as well. 
Um, and the fact that it was this amazing character that any actress would dream of playing, she's really, you know, they gave me a tour de force arc. And it's something that I've been praying for my whole career. And, and then on top of it, this amazing cast, I mean, this man right here, I was just, when we did our scenes together, which you guys will see once it airs, I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> it's Richard Dreyfuss. Richard lo loves that sort of reaction from women. Yeah. <laughs> I usually did get you see it his face? because they're afraid that I'm gonna forget my lines. No, he's so great. And he, and he was so generous and <clears throat> giving, by the way, to me as a, a scene partner. But that, and then the fact that it was, um, it's such a topical, important, subject that you know needs to be shared so I just was it was kind of like I hit the jackpot with this one Richard we haven't seen your character yet can you just tell us who he is and how he shows up he's in second he's in the second episode I'm the white guy <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna get to that because it's as well I'm um, an entrepreneur and I build private prisons <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so, so there's there's a financial stake. Confirmed for the Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> that should get you there. So, um, Gina, well, I'll ask you, and Reggie can respond as well. The opening scene is a is a risky choice. One would have assumed you would have made something else. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have had a white cop shooting a black kid, mm -hmm. and instead you have a black cop shooting a white college kid. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you've given this a lot of thought. Can you go through the process for us? Did you consider making it differently? Would it have been a different film altogether <coughs> had the, the races changed and the victims changed? I think, uh, you know, when Reg and I started talking about what we knew what we wanted to say to the world, and the question for us was how, what is the best way to, to share that narrative? And, and we did go back and forth and, and talk about what was the best way, and um, we started talking about, you know, what if we flipped the narrative as a way into the story? Uh, we found that it enabled us to do a couple things. I mean, one of the impetuses for doing that was that it was so disheartening for us during the Zimmerman trial that you started reading about how much money this man was getting from people that were sending it to try and help Across him. Across the country, um, yeah. And people stopped seeing Trayvon as the victim. He was, a, you know, a, a kid. He was a kid that got murdered, and that narrative was getting lost because in some ways people weren't able to empathize with him. So uh, we thought that in, in flipping that we could create a character and a storyline that people could empathize, could put themselves in... Um, this mother's shoes and then this young man's shoes and see somebody that looked like them and start to empathize. And when you empathize, then you can connect and, and hopefully change could come. And then coupled with that, in dealing with two murders, also the murder of a young black teen, we, were, we are able to, over the course of 10 hours, really uh, dig into the way that uh, the community, the media, the audience treats murders uh, based on the race of the individual who was murdered. Um, and that was a narrative that we wanted to talk, to, uh, talk about as well, because again, how it seems when these shootings happen, one of the first things that happens is that you start to demonize the victim and try to make excuses of why somebody got shot, um, as opposed to they shouldn't have been shot in the first place. Reg? Well, I think the other thing that was interesting about it, you know, because we have all these reasons of why this, this choice made sense. But quite frankly, it was like very instinctual. Like in our first conversation, it came up. We we're like, yeah, we should do this. And it was later on when we tried to, you know, understand, yeah, like, why are we doing this? And, you know, but, but it, was, it was a very instinctual choice. And, and I think that's why it was like great with us working together. It was like we, and because we'd been living with this, we understood immediately why we needed to do that. But I think as Gina says, it's very important to, you know, to note that Shots Fired is about you know, two murders, the murder of an of, of a unarmed white guy and the murder of an unarmed black guy. And, and one of the you know, first things that we really dealt with is that we wanted to make this a murder mystery. And so for us, it's a who done it and a why done it. You know, we know Jesse Carr was killed, but we don't know why. Um, we know Joey Campbell is killed. We don't know who. 
Now, do you all believe in socially relevant and redeeming art? Do you actually think that when you make 10 hours of television that culture can influence politics, <laughs> that, uh, that art transforms public opinion? I mean, it's not just a labor of love. It seems like you're here not just in, on screen, but with us today, because there's some important themes here that you want the world to know. Yeah, I think whenever you're dealing with human emotions, and hopefully that's what we're doing, we're, you know, we're getting into people's imaginations and into their hearts, I think that you know, if you imagine yourself in the shoes of, uh, if, if myself imagines myself in the shoes of a white mother who has a son who was murdered, it gives me a different perspective than something that I would have been thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And the great thing that they do here in this um, event is they really give time to so many different perspectives. And so I think the audience is gonna be able to say, hey, wait, I didn't, I didn't think of that. I didn't think about you know, what it feels like to be a cop, you know, pulling over somebody and the fear of that cop walking up to that, you know, to that car door. What does that feel like? Um, and I think they do it really well. But I think if you have empathy, then, you know, maybe that you, we, that's what we need. We need more empathy and compassion right now. Richard, and always, so. I, you, you. You've been in this business a long time, Richard. I mean, you obviously believe to some degree that when you make 10 hours of film that it has a purpose beyond the art itself. I think if you're talking about intent, no. You don't have to think of it being socially relevant. It's the result that counts. And we don't listen to Beethoven or Mozart or see or read Shakespeare dependent on his bio and what his political partisanship was. We get from, the sh from these plays or whatever, what we get. And I don't think an artist always knows either. And I think that you can start out with one reason, money, and end up with The Tempest <laughs> and Hamlet. And nor should, is the question it's not a wrong question to ask, but it would be more interesting to go back and look at stuff, Hamlet or whatever, or films from the 20s and 30s, and see, do they have any socially relevant things to say at the time, or is that something we take from them now? I remember doing a play once when I was a kid, and there was another actor in the show, and one night he was just great. He was great. And I said to him, boy, oh boy, you were so hot tonight. And he said, it wasn't me, it was the muse. Hmm. And I said, fuck the muse. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the muse when you're bad? <laughs> Learn to take credit, you know? And I mean it, an actor, an artist, whoever. Sometimes you've heard a thousand times writers who say, I started off writing a character and then it, the character got away from me. You've heard that a thousand times. Well, that's what we do. And we also set out to make socially relevant art. And then we butt heads against the business side of things. And that's, you know, that's the film business. And, uh, but you don't have to be uh, a good guy to be a great artist. You really don't. But that's true. Reggie, I know, you know a lot of bad guys who are making art. <laughs> <laughs> Reggie, I know you're pretty idealistic in the making of art. Do you feel that way about this project? Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, um, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm unapologetically idealistic. Um, you know, from New York, went to the high school performing arts had a great teacher who taught us theater can change the world. And, and I bought in. And, 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 and so I'm still buying in. And so for me, um, that's what gets me up, you know? It's like feeling like I have a cause bigger than myself. Now, what I've learned and continue to learn in this journey 
is that you know it's more effective if you you know you know for me you know start out with something I want to say and then you hide it, and then you dig into the characters, and you know I, I have the, you know what Richard was talking about some writers let the characters get away like when it really starts going well. Is in like it's just kind of weird. Like the characters just take over. Like you have to get out of you have to get out of the way yeah. and let the characters be like real human beings. But you know, um, yeah. And, and so I think really what it comes down to is how do you craft it? But look, people spend millions and millions and billions of dollars to make you believe that Coke is the real thing, or if you care enough to send the very best, you'll send a Hallmark or whatever it is. So we know that, you know, with a lot of research that can affect behavior, um, but we also know that, you know, we, we can't preach and be in a soapbox. So we hope that, you know, we have to enter somebody's world to lead them out. And so we want to bring you into the characters and then see what happens. What do you think about which audience this, uh, this has the potential to affect most? Do you think that it speaks more directly to the Black Lives Matter movement? Or do you think that it could awaken the consciousness of those who are indifferent or dismissive of the Black Lives Matter movement? You know, I might, I'd like to start with the one white guy on stage, aside from the moderator, because <laughs> maybe, Richard, you might have some thoughts He's about- not black. He's not white. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as awkwardly black as I can get. <laughs> Um, Do we think that this has the potential to reach both audiences in the same way? I mean, Sana said, well, you know, empathy, everyone should be able to do that, and that everyone is going to pick up because the production is so textured, and there's so many different characters, and their complexity is all on display, that every, it's there for everybody. But maybe it's really there for one audience that we're really trying to reach. First of all, I think that it has to reach uh, black and white audiences, or else it will fail. Yeah. <clears throat> and we did this, uh, last night we did this uh, same setup in front of a 98% black audience. They went nuts. Mm -hmm. They went crazy. We were owned by them. We were their pets. <laughs> I mean, they loved this film so much. And I said, you know, everyone in here except me is black and, and, <laughs> You've got to reach the other people, the white audience. You've got to, or else what did we make this for? And what that means is, especially today, how many times have we heard people say, no one is talking to the other side? I've heard Republican campaign people say they're appalled by Trump and they just don't know how to get to the other side. And and reach them. I know Democrats, I know people who voted for Hillary Clinton who wouldn't entertain the notion of talking to, well, wait a minute, we're a country here. We're a nation of different people. And we are a nation of different people. The only thing we have in common is America. And if we don't teach it, we don't got it. And we're a culture of different um, groups, ethnic groups that don't just merge into one another, they stay unmerged for hundreds of years. And we have the worst racist problem in the world. It's mm -hmm. bigger here than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's because, well, there's lots of reasons. But one of the reasons is that we had an opportunity 150 years ago, we killed 750,000 men in an attempt, and then we popped the guy who could have saved us. And it was a waste, a complete waste. And, in a, and, and ever since then, every offense has been committed, every sin, and, and no one takes responsibility for educating us, really, and solving this problem. They, we, don't, we don't think about solving a problem, we just think about reflecting it, of reflecting the pain. Well, wait a minute, I got kids here. I got kids, I got a grandson. I don't want just a country that reflects its problems. I wanna solve them. 
and race. Imagine being a member of a cop, of a, you know, a police force. And he's, he's terrified. He's terrified the minute he sees a black man walking down the street. And the black guy is as terrified as he is. I have a friend. I made a friend in Charlotte when we shot this. He was a teamster. He was about 70 years old. He was the most enlightened man I'd ever met. And he was really, he, he was. And I said, why are you the way you are? Why are you so understanding of things? And he told me that he had gone to high school and college with a very well-known artist in the community, black guy who was poet and singer and whatever. And one day, this white guy said, I, I have to, I can't, I, I gotta ask, what is your fucking problem? He said, why are you so upset all the time? You, we freed you, you know? <laughs> You're free, what, why are you always? And the guy looked at him and said, let me ask you a question. When you wake up in the morning, is the first thing that you think, I'm white? And he said, no. He said, well, the first thing I think when I wake up, I'm black. And my friend got it. He understood for the first time <clears throat> the, the, the horror of all the overlay of every minute, of every mythology, of every culture, of every hanging, of every lynching, of every, every, and that's walking down the street. And he's got a gun on his hip. I, we have to solve it. Hmm. I'm wondering what your reaction to Richard was. Uh, both well, the first you, thing I think when yeah. I wake up is I'm human. I don't think, I don't, I get, I get the point that you're making and I get the, the point in relation to that story in terms of trying to explain it to that man, but I don't think that. I don't, and I don't feel like a lot of my black brothers and sisters go around thinking I'm black. And if they do, it's like a celebration. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, what was the question, though? The <laughs> I succeeded. <laughs> you totally succeeded. Well, I wanted to know that which audience do you think that this oh, has a chance of affecting? I think it, it's universal. I think one of the reasons why I hope, I have hopes for this Love and Basketball, out of all the films that I've made, I always said I wanted to make new classics. And to me, a classic is a story that transcends time and, and culture, and um, it speaks to all people. And that's what I think Shots Fired is gonna do. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm putting out there. That's what I intend for it to do. do, do you, did you worry about getting it right, white, black? Uh, I know that you said, Reggie, maybe you can talk about this, that there was something called Shots Fired University, is that what you called it? <laughs> that there was some real due diligence done by the Bythewoods yeah. to really bring in lots of voices and perspectives to make sure that it was done right. Mm -hmm. yeah. G, you wanna you wanna start it off? You've been it's a, okay. Um, yeah, to, when you're dealing with a real life subject and a subject that was so deeply personal to us and to to many people, we absolutely felt a responsibility to get it right, and that started with research. I think that's a key to all of our work is research, um, and so. We put together just a group of people from all different walks of life within the story we wanted to tell, and put that together so that our writing staff could, uh, it really was a university. Every single day we had a couple different people and we were very, very fortunate to have some phenomenal guests. Uh, Eric Holder was uh, such a, a huge help to us as the writers and also to Stefan James who plays uh, Preston. Um, um, Raymond Kelly who- Former police commissioner of New York. Who basically father of uh, Stop and Frisk. Um, Michelle Alexander, who wrote an incredible book called The New Jim Crow. Um, we had a woman named Francesca Citrone, who was a, a investigator for the DOJ, who was a tremendous help, not only in, in feeding 
Ash, Sanaa's character, um, and just a woman who's gone through so much of what Ash's character did, but how that affects uh, your worldview as a, as a, a law enforcement and then also as female. Um, we had another woman, Cheryl Dorsey, who was a 20-year vet of the LAPD, who was a tremendous a help as well. Um, who else do we have? Oh, well, geez, Wanda Johnson, the mother of Austin Grant, who uh, Fruitvale Station was that that film was made for, as well. Who was uh, wrecked us for for two hours. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and I mean, in, in many ways, shots fired. University was just this intense two-week process um, that really brought our characters to life and helped inform us of uh, the human beings we were, uh, we were writing about. And so it was no longer, like it, it, you know, research can make it become more academic, but it had the opposite effect because we were actually talking to real life people. Watched a lot of documentaries as well. Um, our writer's room was like a mini museum. You know, it was really like pictures of everybody on the wall. As soon as you got off our elevator, um, there was a big picture of Emmett Till uh, Sana and I were talking earlier about the synchronicity of there shots so fired. There was so much synchronicity. Because just when, when our last day of shooting, it turned out was, was, was Emmett Till's birthday. Oh, wow. Just, yeah. And it was, yeah, and the whole thing was inspired by him. Mm -hmm. And then um, Stefan, who plays Preston, and then Shamir, who plays, what's his name? ACO, his brother. His brother, who I hook up with in the... You know. <laughs> that was a good scene. It's good, right? I'm just saying. Um, they, <laughs> just saying. I'm just saying. I just they, thought that's the moderator's prerogative. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> I kind of like that scene. You should roll that again. <laughs> they are real brothers in real life. And they didn't, they didn't plan that. They just yeah. happened. I read with a hundred guys. And wow. not really, but <laughs> it felt that's like 20. that. Yeah. That's um, and they're real brothers in real life. It's, wow. I was just, yeah. yeah. That was just the few of many. Thank I will you. say, to support you, <laughs> um, as an actor, you watch, you work with actors, and anyone who tells you that if I'm working with a bad actor, I don't know that they're bad because I'm, I'm <laughs> working. Bullshit. You know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you have anyone in mind? <laughs> There's a performance in the show that is just <laughs> telling you. She is so great. Shana is so great. And the fact that Reggie and, and, and Gina wrote a character with such a great character flaw is, I mean, he, she, they handed you absolutely the greatest idea in the world. And she ran with it to the point that I was like, I knew this was rare. This was Thank a you, Richard. Thank but you. you know, and but last <laughs> night she said, she said it so drained her that she couldn't work for a while, and and I believed it because man, you're gonna see some stuff. It was the muse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it speaks a little to the cynicism <laughs> about our legal system that comes through so nicely in these episodes. Um, you know, and there's some really interesting, the Sana character, uh, the, the situation with the custody case. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what Richard is talking about. You know, I mean, I don't know if this is the point of view of the film, but it does talk about, you know, black people aren't gonna get a shake in the legal system no matter what area, forget police shootings, right? Mm -hmm. An angry black woman in a tough job is gonna have a harder time getting custody of her kid, right? And that's, that is yeah. one, one premise here that's being you know played out in ten hours. And so you have so you said angry black woman, which has a real kind of long history. It's yes. like a long stereotype. Which and is exactly why the the, the, the legal system would take yeah. the stereotypical view. Yeah, but I have to rephrase that because we she, Ash is not an angry black woman. <laughs> She is, and you know, somebody just yesterday, Gina and I were talking about it, somebody said on Twitter, how, you know, how are you gonna address the fact that this is an angry black woman? And you know, black women are gonna have a problem with Ash being an angry black woman. So I just wanna rephrase that and say that she is, she is a passionate woman and she's relentless about her beliefs and she's a fighter. Right. And yet. And she's multidimensional. And yet she's tossed into a system. Yes. Right? 
Mm -hmm. She's tossed into this system <laughs> that she has to that she has to you know somehow vindicate yeah. the, her love for her daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are uh, there are other premises here that are interesting. That I mean, the relationship between uh, the brothers uh, is very interesting, and the relationship with their father, who by the way is a veteran of love and basketball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. He played the jock father in that one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Allstate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, that, that, it does raise an interesting question. I mean, I, I I hope I'm not stepping into another racial issue, but he does. He one point the father says in episode three, he seems to be much more proud of having his son play in the National Football League than having a son be a, a superstar in the Department of Justice and mm -hmm. you know go to parties with governors. Right. And it's a it's a enormously interesting point to think that that's actually his point of view. He literally says to his son this is not the World Series. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a really good moment and a great scene. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's just also always fascinating when you do work and you put it out in the world and and it, it affects people in different ways. I mean, and I think this might even go to your other question of who, who it's for. You know, the complication that Preston has with his dad, like, maybe it's subconscious, but there was no intent on, like, hey, we're going to say something about black fathers. Like, it was really just a human issue that everybody can kind of deal with. You guys haven't seen it yet, but a real kind of human issue of a father who's present in his life, but isn't really, but thinks his son is selling himself short. And so there was, you know, and, and I think like that, if it, if it, you know, there's, if it reaches everybody, it reaches everybody because everybody's human. Like there's no, there's no, intent on like pandering to a certain audience. Like, okay, we gotta do this so this audience watches it and we gotta do this. It's like, let's just get in there. Let's, you know, one of the things that you said in your introduction, which I appreciated, it was, it was this 360 degree panoramic view with Dolby sound, that sort of thing I that you like. And I really dug that, you know, <laughs> because, you know, one of the first things that Gene and I said in doing this is, hey, let's give a view from every seat in the house. One of the first things I said with Richard when, when we met, and, and that's really what we look to do, is give a view from every seat in the house. Now, speaking more cynicism about the government and the legal system, I couldn't help but think of the Rosenberg trial. Because in the Rosenberg trial, there were Jews prosecuting Jews, and the judge was Jewish. And there is a theme here that you have this sort of up and coming African American, Preston, mm -hmm. who's being recruited to take on this case. Everyone knows why they're asking him. They tell him. Right. And he's game. I'm there. I'm right. ready to do it. I'll go where justice goes. He says to your character, right, just do your job. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not a white-black thing. Just do your job. But I wonder whether that is, there's a strong point there, right, of African Americans against African Americans. They say to him, oh, this is the case you're after? You're interested in a white guy being shot? What about Joey? What about the other kid getting shot? So I, I wonder, there's clearly a statement here about the fact that he's put in this compromising position, which he accepts. He wants the gig. Mm -hmm. Sana is the one that pulls him out, in a way. She, Ash. A, right, Ash. <laughs> Ash, Ash. Bad uh, Ash. Bad Ash. But not angry. <laughs> not angry. No, not angry. <laughs> not angry. Uh, you know, that, that, that she pulls him back as if to say, look, you know, there's another killing here. And we, got a, we have some justice that's due also to this African-American family. Yeah, but what a great complication, right, to take somebody who's 26 years old, bring them in as an interim um, a prosecutor, and this guy wants to be the youngest attorney general in the history of the United States. That's his goal. That's his goal. And through the course of it, can we take that character and start him here and have him end up somewhere else. And that's really what we look to, to, to do. And that's really what like, gets us off. Like, can we like, get this guy here and give him an incredible arc? Um, but there's no judgment being made, right? I mean, you're not judging him because he knows it's really through prosecuting another black cop that this could be career making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, the, we don't judge our characters. I think what was interesting for us I mean, a couple things was one that you have these two different, um, you know, 
Ash is, is an investigator, black woman, Preston, young black man, two totally different worldviews um, that, are, that are coming uh, into conflict. One is very optimistic and also very ambitious. Ash is ambitious, but she's also been within the law uh, enforcement for so many years and been, knows the truth, has been beaten down, has been forced, been faced with racism and sexism. Um, and it, it really is what side is going to win out, the optimism or the realism. And it was a very interesting thing over the course of the 10 hours to really have these two try to fight and, and have their own worldview win. But as Red said, it was also an incredible arc to take a guy who is okay with being used initially for, in his mind, the greater good, which was to become you know, someone special. And we found that just a very interesting character trait. Aside from the politics that we're involved in, do you think that just the art, just from the feature films that we've seen this past year with so many African-American themes, uh, Moonlight, of course, and, and you, we, you and I talked about Fruitvale Station from a few years ago, which dealt with another police shooting of an African-American, but hidden figures and uh, uh, loving Fences. that there's, and right, there, there's a number of, that there's, this is a really open time to examine this art and really get in, you know, meaningfully interested in these issues in a way that are not defensive, that are really just open-hearted. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something you couldn't have planned on, right? right? You, mm -hmm. I mean, you, there's a thing in, this, in the show, um, there's a character who's a black cop, and uh, you realize, I, I was, was struck last night that he's a, he's a man who lives here, and he's a cop, and he's black. And that means that there's different communities, there's different pulls on him. You know, when you become a policeman, you become a policeman. You're, you're a guy in the cop, you're a cop. And you feel the same things that every cop feels. And then you also are a black guy. And you are also a father. And it's like, this overlay of different pressures that pulls people apart or pull people together. That's the best thing about the show, is that you're gonna be uh, surprised at who you empathize with and why. And um, mm -hmm. the thing that Reggie first said to me when, I, when we talked was, I wanna do a show where there are no heroes and no villains, where everyone is, it's all mixed up. And I said, you got me. I love it. So yeah. <laughs> I, that's why I did it. And, and I'll tell you, there's a, it, it's so clearly t stated. It's so well done that you see what you've experienced. If you don't know anyone uh, in the police force, if you know anyone who's got, you know, a Republican who votes for Trump, do you recognize them anymore? And someone who will vote for Hillary no matter what. There's people who are, you can see the different things that pull them. And this show is going to pull you. Saying, you know, so much of what we did here was subconscious. Like, you know, I had to think about your question. Because Gina and I never sat back and said, hey, Gina, are we cynical about the criminal justice system? Like, <laughs> never really thought about it. But, but, I am. But, 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 I, but, yeah, clearly we are. Um, and and I, I will say, I think it's also very interesting to put this out in the world at this time. You know, when Eric Holder was Attorney General, he called the Civil Rights Division the crown jewel of the Justice Department. We're really concerned about what is the Justice Department going to look like now. Um, you know, one of the things that the Department of Justice did under uh, you know, Loretta Lynch, is that they looked at various police departments that had bad pattern and practice. And it just certainly feels that we would probably go against that. You know, one of the things that, that, that Trump said in his congressional address is he, he made a big point about police officers and how they protect us and they deserve all our support and, and all this stuff. And certainly they deserve our support. And my grandfather was a police officer. And nobody in their right mind wants to see somebody go out there and, and shoot and kill police officers. But also nobody that really gives a damn 
wants police departments and police with bad pattern and practice to just go like unpunished and that there are no repercussions for that. And so that's part of the kind of conversation that needs to happen within the criminal justice system, and not even just within the criminal justice system, just between fathers and sons and mothers and sons and daughters and just families. So, you know, a, a large part of what we're really hoping to do is just expand conversation as well. I'll, t I'll tell you what I think is interesting about the show, and I've seen more episodes. Many of you may have read over the summer there's an African-American professor, economics professor at Harvard who did a longitudinal study to determine that actually black people are no more likely to be, sh to be shot by policemen than white people. In fact, at one point he even said, this is an African-American economics professor. Uh, but then he said the following. He said he gave these statistics. He says, yes, but when it comes to the non-lethal use of force, then it's not even a question. Pushing uh, against the floor, pushing, shoving against the wall, handcuffing, stop and frisk, there the numbers, this non-lethal use of force are disproportionate. And so this, one of the things the show does in the context of these two shootings is that it really does show the kind of contempt that the police departments the, <coughs> have for the African-American community. That comes across very strongly in the show, a kind of uh, you know, hostile attitude towards African-Americans. It's that, fear. Fear on the part of the... It's fear. You see a black guy and you're afraid. And you're guilty, but you're afraid. And that, you know, no one wants to be afraid, so they turn it into something hostile. But it's a bigger... I mean, it's, it's fear. And why is it that fear? Is because you are bombarded constantly by images of, of people of color in a, in a negative way. There is a lack of humanity um, that, and I think one of our characters even says that, you know, blackness has been weaponized. I mean, the fact that you see these videos of grown police officers grabbing and shoving and, and mm -hmm. girls, teenage black girls and, and teen black boys, this thing that just happened in L.A. with a grown officer pulling a gun on a 13-year-old kid. I mean, there's a lack of humanity um, where it's seen as us and them, and that is something absolutely that we wanted to address with the show. I mean, it's not just enough to vent, um, but what Reg and I talk about a lot is, you know, uh, that anybody can portray reality, but an artist portrays what reality should be, and that's absolutely what we're trying to do with this show is, is put out reality and then start to talk about how things can change, what needs to be done differently, what, uh, how do we get off of this, this cycle and, and Again, create characters that you may not interact with in, in your normal life, but get to know them and empathize with them and, and start to understand. Can I just give you like a window into um, your know, family right now. And then let's talk about our family. So our oldest now, you know, we, we talked about when he was 12, he's 16 now, just turned 16. And he's like, dad, what's up with my license? You know, and so during spring break, we're gonna teach him to, to, to drive. And I think any parent will wanna teach their kids like to not be reckless, don't speed. Yeah, if you have friends in there, don't get distracted, no texting. drugs, no texting while driving, all of that stuff. Any responsible parent would teach their kid that. But there's no way in hell I'm not gonna talk to my kid again about what would happen if a cop pulls you over. I mean, like, it's like, you know, and, and maybe, maybe every parent would talk about that, I don't know. What would you say? But certainly, and what, what I would tell him is the same thing my grandfather, who was a police officer, told me. My grandfather taught me how to drive, and he also gave me the talk, which was, not if, but son, when a cop pulls you over, when, when, when a crazy racist dude pulls you over, stay level-headed. Mm. Uh, I miss my grandfather, so excuse me. Was he uh, also from the Bronx? Yeah, he yeah. was. Policed in the community that he lived in. Um, 
That's what I mean. And um, uh, you know, our sons are going to watch this. I don't want like, and be like, damn, dad was crying. On this. <laughs> <laughs> it's worse than that. It was crying yeah. to the hymn. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he policed in the neighborhood that he lived in. And, um, you know, it, it just felt like and when I was a kid, our coaches were with the Police Athletic League, and it didn't feel like your community was under siege and shit, you know? Speaking of the Police Athletic League, I, I have one more question. We'll take some from the audience. You know, I don't want to, you know, reveal too much of the show, but there, are, there's some stuff here that I think is just enormously interesting I've never seen before. Uh, there's two moments, lines, quotes, that actually become explosive. Um, there is, I just hope I'm not giving too much away, but the policeman, we do see some tape of him saying about how, now that I'm gonna be a cop, I get to shoot me some crackers, right? And then there's another scene in which a white cop is coaching his a football team, and he says to his player, now you get your black ass out there. And I wonder whether, you know, in our age of political correctness, that we think that sometimes when, because this is really the problem here with the black African American, the African American cop, that he, he seems like, doesn't seem like a racist in any other way. It's just that they have this on tape and he's at a barbecue. And so people say shit at a barbecue, right? With the camera going and you don't mean it. And it may be that the white coach, I mean, I don't want to give too much away. Maybe that the white coach says, get your black, black ass out there and block. He doesn't mean that either. And yet this show sort of puts it in your face that these are words, they mean something. The daughter says to the dad, yeah, but you, that's racist, dad. And he goes, oh, I didn't mean anything. He was just trying to push the dude's buttons. Yeah, I'm just, just trying to get the best out of that player. I've never seen TV doing that. I mean, I say that it was a brave choice mm -hmm. and really emotionally complex choice. And I wonder whether you thought about, can we do this? <laughs> um. I mean, we just, uh, as Red said, it just always starts with character and who these characters are and, and how they live. And, and we also do find it fascinating in this age of social media that a comment like this guy did, he's drunk, he's at a family barbecue, he's fooling around, and he says this thing. The question is, was it a joke or was it a confession? You know, and that is what. And then the world gets to see it because on social media, everyone watches it. Exactly, and it become it has a life of its own, and it suddenly defines this cop. This is who you are. You're the cracker dude, um, and we see that happening all the time. Um, <laughs> and that's something that we deal with with the show. Hmm. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, did Fox have any qualms or objections over the show's content? Did you get carte blanche? <laughs> We, we did, actually. I mean, when they came to us, it was, do you guys want to do a show? And what show uh, do you want to do? We were given absolute freedom to create the show that we wanted to see, and that was really great. And we never, I mean, we go there, we're telling the truth, and I, we never got a note uh, to pull anything back. We never got a note about that line goes too far, or what are you trying to say with that? It was. This is our yeah, but show. I think we also, you know, kind of earned carte blanche in that one of the things that they demanded is, you know, they really wanted to see a Bible. Yeah. And, and, and a Bible is a sort of a, a, a document that tells you where the characters are going, where the plot and the storyline is going. And, and we presented an 80-page Bible that, like, laid everything out. And based on that and a script, actually, they just sent it straight to series. You know, normally the process is that you shoot the pilot, and then depending on how good the pilot is, Testing. you'll you'll go in, in, into series. But based on the script and the Bible, they said, we will give you 10. This, uh, this question, I guess, is for Sana, Sana and Richard. What was the energy like on the set? It felt real. Um, it was great. Um, it was really hot. <laughs> That's all I remember. It was just so, because we were dressed for fall, which I was so annoyed by. I had like boots and jeans and leather jackets and that wig. Um, I'm talking about the wig. That's, that the was wig. Yeah, hair. we had, oh gosh, this journey of a wig. The wig was like its own character. <laughs> it was like, but it was like working in a sauna, so there is that. But 
it was interesting because if you if you were if you came to set, you would be like, what kind of movie are you making? Because there were the moments of the tears where we were literally like had to do a prayer circle one morning before work because of um, yet another murder mm -hmm. that was all over the TVs and we just had to breathe because it was just too much. But then I think because of the subject matter, there was a lot of laughter, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a huge ensemble and there wasn't, I mean, it was, it, we were all friends and we got together on the weekends and you know, had barbecues and soul food in North Carolina, you know. <laughs> set for you. It was, um, it was a great uh, set because everyone on the set was a pro. And when professionals get together and know their job, there's, there's really nothing better than to realize that this Rube Goldberg device that looks so awkward and wacky works like a precision watch and actors and cinematographers and prop masters and writers, they, everyone gets to do what they do best. And especially when you're dealing with actors in a group, you know, and everyone is, everyone wants to hear the rhythm of the scene and get into it, you know, no one wants to impose. There was no prima donna on the show mm -hmm. and there was no there was no, you know, demands made. We just all understood. And whenever you're acting with actors, it's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. I did a play recently, and every night that we took this company bow, on the company bow I would whisper, go slow. Yeah. This is the payoff. <laughs> and you can't possibly know what it's like to be an actor working with great actors. It's just an extraordinary gift that we show you, you, and you give us back you. And we're part of it. It's an amazing feeling. Thane, just a real quick detour. I just need to say we have two sons, and we love our youngest son <laughs> as much as we love our oldest. And, and, um, yeah. And our son. youngest son inspires us greatly. Yeah. Just want to say that. Yeah. You. you know, I don't know him that well, but just from what you and I talked about, that's Reggie. He's, yeah. he's always worrying about the thing that's, that didn't get mentioned. Yes. Toussaint. You're, 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 Toussaint. you're an honest and... and, and Are my kids going to see this? Yeah. You're Wait a, a minute. You're a great father. <laughs> I have four kids, and I tell each one of them, you're my favorite, don't tell the other. <laughs> I just want to say... You're my favorite, and don't tell the other. <laughs> oh my God! Stand up. This is my son Ben. Ben Dreyfus. Ben. <laughs> ben Dreyfus works for Mother Jones Magazine. He is critically important to their success of late. <laughs> no kidding. He's got a nasty sense of humor. He's on the internet every day. He's got more followers than God. And he actually was in, particularly important in them winning Magazine of the Year. Hmm. Yay. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Richard, where are you going? Richard, I'm gonna you kiss you. That's what I'm gonna do. Aww. Aww. I have to say that in the 20 years that I've been on this stage with Reggie and Richard, I've never had so much familial love. <laughs> <laughs> Father, son, grandfather, grandson. Uh, here's a question that's got lots of local interest. This same situation has been going on in Fort Greenbrook, Brooklyn, for years. But now that the neighborhood has changed, quote, white people have moved in, close quote, we are now on the news. What made you choose North Carolina over Brooklyn? Well, one minute. Well, I mean, this has unfortunately you know, been going on across the country. And 
at the time that we were working on this, um, you know, the Michael Brown case had happened, and, and we started looking at a town like Ferguson, and we just felt like we really, you know, wanted to do an autopsy in a town like Ferguson and, and dissect it from various points of view. But we would also say, you know, we don't feel like this show is only relevant if you're in the South. You know, I just think it's relevant in terms of, of America and, you know, we had to choose some place. And so we chose, um, you know, so we looked at various, various, various cities in the South and, um, and then we, we ended up choosing North Carolina. You know, one of the other things that we, we wanted as a town where we weren't feeling like we were coming in, taking over the town. And do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Because, you know, you did most of that location scouting. I mean, it was, we wanted to find a place where uh, we could use the town and make it uh, a real place. We were creating a fictional place, but we wanted it to feel real. We wanted the show to have authenticity. And so we were very careful, and once we, we found a place to really involve the residents of the town, we never wanted to feel like Hollywood was coming in and occupying. Um, we wanted them to be a part of it. So all the, the background that you see are, are people from the town, people from the houses, people from the neighborhood. And it was really amazing the fact that, I mean, being background is not the most glamorous thing. It's fun and exciting maybe for half a day. Um, and then you realize how much standing around and sitting and waiting. But they kept coming back because they wanted to be a part of it. Um, Aisha, who plays Pastor Janae, her church, the, the group of people that are part of her church, they came every time. They became her flock. They lost it at the, the last day that we were talking about when you announce each actor on, at the end and people were crying. She became real to them. And that's what we really wanted, uh, again, was to just make this town feel real. And that was, we were absolutely um, grateful to the people of the town that believed in our vision. We were very clear what kind of story we wanted to tell. And they bought into that and wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, but, and, and I, would, I would add, though, just but because we created a fictional town, uh, Gate Station is, you know, doesn't exist. Gate Station is a fictional town in North Carolina. And, and because we created a fictional town doesn't mean that we're, you know, turning our back on Florida or Baltimore or Brooklyn. Or it's, it's, it's really hoping to speak to all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's see, we shot 10 hours. The first hour was 11 days, and everyone after that got nine days to shoot. Well, technically eight. We technically kinda, eight, and then we snuck. Every hour. Yeah, every. an extra day. All right, before we say goodnight to our guests, uh, in honor of uh, Cassius is the oldest son. Yes, and Toussaint's birthday is on Saturday. All right, so Friday. Friday. I want to say Friday. something Friday. to remind you. Now that's on Tuesday. All right, all right. The next event that we have next week at the, on the 16th at the uh, City Bar Association is the trial of Muhammad Ali, Cash's nice. play versus the United States. Oh, wow. And it, you, you might be interested in this. We have uh, a, one of the former law clerks who worked on that, who was on that. This is the early case when Muhammad Ali was prevented from boxing because of his mm -hmm. draft evasion. Right. And then we have uh, uh, an Ali biographer, and we have Rosie Perez, oh, the first lady okay. of boxing. So if you're interested in that, folks.org. Um, let me just say, on behalf of the audience, first of all, watch this, tell your friends about this. This is an important event. This is not just a television show. It's an experience. It's a true moment. You've created something of lost, lasting significance, and you have hopefully will have provoked a, a national conversation uh, on racial justice before the law and racial injustice before the law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.